it's not something that is. Just to give you a money's worth, I thought I would show you the artwork that my wife does. This is a painting, but it was done, wait a minute, it was done on an iPad. It was done on an iPad with a, a thing called Paper 53. She's extremely good, and I love them so much that I love to stop my talks with her. You should have her draw your figures. Hmm? What's that? You should have her draw the figures for your papers. <laughs> uh, this would have been a good one for our paper symmetry. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about is the thermal dynamics of complexity. Now, that subject doesn't exist. Of course, um, complexity in thermal dynamics, standard thermal dynamics, certainly does exist. But when I'm talking about something different now, I'm talking about the thermal dynamic approach to thinking about complexity. Uh, just for Charlie, what I mean is com computational complexity for the most part, heat complexity. Although I may mention Komogoro complexity at some point. But the idea, it's a story, I didn't tell a story. The story is that there's a way of thinking about complexity in which it becomes the entropy of a kind of auxiliary system. And, um, and in fact, there's a thermodynamics of it, a second law, and such things. Now, do I know that this is right? Of course I don't. But, um, wow, I did do it, do <laughs> All right, you've seen this picture before. You usually don't see it with curved lines. This is, this is the, um, this is the uh, Penrose, or actually it's not the Penrose diagram. You would officially call it a Kruskal diagram. A Kruskal diagram for an ABS black hole. Here's the usual boundaries, conformal field theories on the boundaries. Here's the future singularity. Here's the past singularity. Here, here are the usual um, horizons. And we can think of the black hole interior, the part from which we can't get out, as this, uh, this triangle up in here. I've also, and now I'll ask you to remember about um, about uh, Adam's talk that there's something or other that grows in the black hole. This is a little bit peculiar because these there are two black holes here. There's a black hole on this side, and there's a black hole on this side, and the only real relationship between them is that they're entangled. And that entanglement seems to be enough to create a space-time in behind the black hole. And according to the idea that, uh, that the computational complexity of the quantum state of the two-sided thermal field double state here is uh, the complexity is action. I'll just remind you how it works. You pick a time, you draw what we call the Wheeler-DeWitt patch. The Wheeler-DeWitt patch is basically the union of all possible space-like surfaces that connect uh, the two boundaries. So it's this region in here. You take the portion of it behind the horizon. It contains a little piece over here, a little piece over here, and the Einstein-Hilbert action of this region. And you can just say the volume of the region. That will work. That will work just fine. The volume with some coefficients in front of it will work just fine. That is the computational complexity of the state of the system as time goes forward, or at, least the core, or at least that's the hypothesis. Now, I want to point out that there are not only black holes. In fact, I shouldn't even call these things black holes. Let me call them condensed objects. <coughs> this is at least more than one kind of condensed object. The lower part here is a white hole. Stuff can come out of the horizon. So the same Penrose diagram shows a white hole and a black hole. And if you look at the corresponding wheel of the width patch for the white hole, you'll notice that the volume of the white hole shrinks with time, whereas the volume of the black hole up above grows with time. In other words, if you move these times forward here, you get more and more volume in these corners here. The corners look small, but they're not small. White holes and black holes. Both kinds of things exist, and we should distinguish them. OK, now let me, uh, let me uh, go through a little couple of exercises, which Adam partly went through. 
let's think about the computational complexity as a function, of, it's really a function of two times for the, for the two-sided black hole here. Let's take this time and that time, draw the wheel with the width patch, and then the computational complexity is the volume of regions in here. Okay. Good. Now, next step, I want to probe this geometry a little bit. I want to probe the, uh, the hypothesis. So what I'm going to do, oops, I should not have done that. Let's go back. Yeah, let's go back to here. Um, one more step. What I want to do is probe the geometry. I'm going to probe it by perturbing the left side of my code with a tiny, tiny perturbation, one qubit's worth of uh, perturbation, one thermal photon will throw in the remote pass. Now we're following Schenker and Stanford's logic, and that creates a perturbation which moves, follows the light cone, but most important, it blue shifts as it falls into the horizon. And it becomes progressively, exponentially with time, more and more energetic. So it forms an extremely intense shock wave. The further back you go, before you throw it in, the more intense and the more uh, focused, the more, what's what I say, more energetic that shock wave is. And so we can ask now, what is the comp computational complexity of the state after you've thrown in the shock wave? Now, there's two things to know about how you have to deform or change the story away from what we originally drew here without the shock wave. The first is that to create the shock wave, let's suppose we're working in throwing a picture at time t equals zero, we have to run the system backward, put in the perturbation called w, and run it forward again, and create this precursor operator. Precursor operator is what we're going to put in, and that is a rather complex operator. The further back we go, the further we run forward, the more complex this operator and adds complexity to the quantum state of the thermal field double state. Okay. Uh, how much additional complexity does it add? Well, can it? This beer is a bad idea. <laughs> Josh. I could have helped. And what? I could have helped. <laughs> okay. How much complexity did the precursor add? Well, um, Adam showed you how it worked. Remember those pictures with the colliding gates that canceled each other and the beautiful graphics, okay? The answer was twice the mass, actually I think it's four times the mass of the black hole because there were, no, no, twice, I'm sorry, twice the mass of the black hole times the time that you went backward minus the scrambling time. Why minus the scrambling time? Because there's a lot of cancellation. Uh, this was a single qubit operator. Most of U cancels, most of U dagger, but that persists for scrambling time, and at the end of the scrambling time, that's when the complexity first starts to increase. And if you plug in what scrambling time is, the answer is twice m t minus the radius of curvature of the ABS space times the logarithm of the entropy of the black hole. A fairly complicated formula. Not one that, uh, that uh, you might have guessed immediately. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's play the game. Remember that when a light ray falls through a shock wave, it gets displaced. I call it the Atuf shift. You call it something else. Um, Shapiro time delay. Shapiro time delay, or the Atuf shift. Uh, what it says is that a light ray falling through a high energy shock wave gets kicked and shifted before it goes through on the way through the, uh, the shock wave. So, in other words, the actual wheel of the width patch looks like this. And down here, it looks like this. Notice some extra area, or some extra volume here was created, and also some extra volume down here. <laughs> that extra volume, if you calculate it, is exactly the expected additional computational complexity. And it's more than just agreement with the formula I wrote down, the detailed functional dependence of it agrees. Detailed functional dependence of function of time 
uh, from the action formulation and from the circuit uh, calculation that, uh, that Adam showed us how to do, those agree. That's, if anything, the clearest evidence that I know for this conjecture. Okay, now I want to show you a peculiar property. Let's move this time forward here. What I'm going to do is move this time forward, upward, toward the future, and see what happens. We moved it upward, we got a little bit of extra volume over here, but we lost a lot of volume over here. Incidentally, all of this stuff over here canceled. There's a symmetry, there's time translation invariance. The orange and the yellow are identical uh, up, to a, up to a Lorentz transformation. You gained a little bit over here, but you lost a lot more over here. The implication is that if you go upward in time over here, the complexity decreases. I indicate that by drawing an arrow downward. The complexity decreases or increases in the downward direction. That seems a little bit abnormal. Complexity would seem like something that you would expect to grow, and here I'm telling you that in this context, it decreases. That decrease of complexity appears in a great many cases, in all of the cases I know where this kind of thing happens, it is always correlated with an intense shock wave just behind the horizon. We could call that a firewall. It is what I think, uh, think of as a firewall. Then the firewall is associated with the abnormal situation of decreasing complexity. What about for a white hole, there it's decreasing. But yeah, 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 that's, uh, that's true. But if you, that's true, but if you turn the white hole just a little bit, uh, so yeah, you're right. Yeah. This would be only on one point on the sphere, right? One side if it was a no, 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 no. This could have been thrown in at one point in the sphere, but by the time, <laughs> by the time, you know, it's like an Eichelberg sexual metric. It, uh, it, grows, it grows horizontally, it grows and broadens as it uh, redshifts. So by the time the high energy shock wave gets into here, it covers the whole horizon. And the horizon you think is spherical? Or like the horizon is spherical. The horizon is spherical. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, okay, now just to show you what's going on. going on in a more intuitive way is I'm going to turn the picture around by 180 degrees. That will interchange left and right and it will also interchange past and future. I'm going to cheat a tiny bit. I've turned it around, but I've left the red shock wave on the left side instead of putting it on the right side. That makes no difference whatever for the simple reason that the jump in the shock wave, the jump at the shock wave here doesn't much care if it's uh, within a plunk length of the horizon on the left or the right. So that doesn't make any difference. But now look what happened. What happens is in the white hole region, the complexity is increasing. What happened here? What happened here is we took a system of decreasing complexity, namely the white hole, where the complexity was decreasing, and we perturbed it. We just flicked it. What happens when you flick a uh, system whose entropy is going backward? You wait a little while and you suddenly discover that the entropy is going forward again. Going backward in entropy is unstable. This is telling us that going backward in complexity is equally unstable. So when you look at it from this side, it's not so surprising. A thing which was going backward, you flipped it over here, and after a little bit of time, it started going forward. Okay, so let's summarize that. Here's the usual form of the Penrose diagram. Uh, a shock wave on the horizon seems, appears to be, or, or a firewall appears to be correlated with decreasing complexity on the side where the firewall is. Here's another picture of what goes on. This is the wormhole, uh, the, uh, the einstein rosen bridge connecting the two black holes. The shock wave is over here somewhere, near the right side of the horizon. And something funny is going on. Instead of the wormhole expanding, as, uh, as Adam showed us, 
you notice it's this side is going the wrong way. It's decreasing. And that's abnormal. And that, I believe, is connected with the existence of a firewall. So now the question comes, is there anything in the laws of complexity which protect against this? A second law of complexity would protect against this. A second law meaning that complexity tends to increase. Yeah. So do you think that uh, is whether or not the complexity is increasing or decreasing a property of the state? <laughs> you know that I know that I don't know the answer. Of course, that's why I asked. <laughs> You'll have plenty of opportunity to ask questions and embarrass both of us. <laughs> Alright, so is there a second law of quantum complexity that protects horizons? And more generally, is there a thermodynamics of complexity in which entropy is replaced by complexity? Now, the complexity that I wrote here has these little brackets around it. That means ensemble average. And what exact ensemble we're talking about? Yes, sir. I didn't understand your answer to Daniel's question. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I thought uh, it's a trivial product state as a reference, and then the convective is a state property. What was this again? The convective is a state property. I found that too. The complexity is a state property. Yes, yes. Yeah, but whether it's increasing or decreasing is not a property. I suspect, well, we can come back to that. I think it is. I think it is. If you, you complex conjugate the wave function to go from one to the other. You need so. to know the Hamiltonian, right? Hmm? You need to know the Hamiltonian. Well, uh, in the CFT, uh, believe it or not, the states of the system determine the Hamiltonian. It's called Hogg's theorem. It's called Hogg's theorem. If you have to resort to Hogg's theorem, you're really uh, pushing it. <laughs> This gentleman was my student. <laughs> <laughs> now he is. Now he is. The shoes have gotten too big. He actually arrived that way. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning to say, I don't really know precisely how to say this. The statement is every chaotic quantum system, now first of all, I don't even know what I mean by a chaotic quantum system, right? But we'll come to that. Every chaotic quantum system, and I'll call it Q, of n qubits has associated a classical system A, which I'll call the auxiliary system, of exponentially many degrees of freedom, classical, and the entropy of A is the ensemble average of the complexity of Q. That's the speculation. Let me go back a step. You'll notice here that the complexity is exponentially large in the number of qubits. The classical entropy, if it was to if it was to correspond to a classical entropy, it would correspond to a classical entropy of exponentially many degrees. Um, Lenny, yeah. for your associated classical system, could you not just take a classical description of the whole wave function? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Of course. All right. Okay. Then the entropy of that plus what, what would be the entropy of the discrete? Uh, we'll I, I think you know for some definition of entropy and complexity, I think this would almost be true. <laughs> okay. Box. Box. <laughs> okay, what about quantum chaos? Well, first thing about classical chaos. For classical chaos, we know what it means. Nearby states of a system exponentially diverge. In quantum mechanics, nearby states, the distance between them stays constant. That's because inner products stay constant. Well, wait a minute. Is that really true that the distance between states stays constant? The answer all depends on what we mean by distance. There are four Bill Clinton or something. 
So this comes to the question then, which uh, Scott, uh, which Scott discussed last time or yesterday. What is the distance between two quantum states? And of course, there are many possible answers. Let's take the first answer. The first answer is the famous Fubini study. <coughs> study. It's not study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Fubini study metric on state space. That's just the inner product metric. The whole thing. Cosine of the distance between two points is the absolute value of the inner product. And notice that its maximum is pi over 2. It never gets bigger than pi over 2. And it's not the right metric on Hilbert space, on, the, on human vectors in Hilbert space, for the purposes of chaos. Let's give an example. Here are two states, A and B, which are almost identical except for one qubit. The distance between them is exactly pi over 2. And they're very similar to each other, and they're not very far from each other. Let's uh, change B. B now is quite different than A, because it's not all that different. It only takes n flips if there are n uh, qubits. It only takes n flips. But still, it's much harder to go from A to B than it was previously when I had zeros here. But nevertheless, the distance between them is the same, namely, pi over 2. Let's make it worse. Here are two states. We start with the same state, and we run them both with a chaotic Hamiltonian or with a generic uh, Hamiltonian. We run them for a long, long time. These states, in some sense, will get very, very different from each other. In fact, in a certain sense, we would expect, classically, we would expect them to exponentially diverge. And I think there is a sense in which quantum mechanically they diverge, but we have to define that sense. So that raises the question, is there a metric that better reflects the similarity of, uh, that better reflects the similarity of A and B and the differences between A prime and B prime than the usual metric? Whatever this metric is, it should reflect the difficulty of making a transition from one state to another. That's what I would mean by that they're, hard, that they're far from each other, that it's hard to make a transition between them. And also, measuring interference between them is also difficult. This is what Scott talked about last time, and so I won't go over it. But uh, that's the basic idea, that is there a metric which has that property? And as Scott uh, alluded to last time, yes, there is, and it's called relative complexity. I just made up that name. If you want, you can call it Sustain but, uh, uh, right, what is it? <laughs> it's the minimal number of quantum gates that it takes to go from starting with B to get to A, or vice versa, it's symmetric. The minimum number of gates to make a transition between the two states. And that's a new form of metric. Now, I'm going to work with, instead of working with states, it's easier to actually work with unitary operators. Instead of talking about the complexity of the state, I'm going to talk about the complexity of the, of the set of operators as can connect them. But in particular, let's just focus on the unitary operator. The complexity of the unitary operator is the minimum number of gates that it needs to prepare you, <coughs> starting with the identity. You can also talk about relative complexity. Relative complexity of V and U is just the minimum number of gates that it takes to go from U to be. So that's an analogous to state complexity, but now it's unitary operator complexity. What are its properties? First of all, it's non-negative. You can't have a negative number of gates. Second of all, it's zero if, if and only if. Then. It's zero if and only if u equals v. Third of all, it's symmetric. You see that it's symmetric, you just invert this operator we always assume that whatever a gate is, its permission conjugate is also a gate. And so the same number of gates will connect U and V as V and U. And finally, here's an exercise for Scott's class. Scott, there's an exercise for you. It's also sub-additive, meaning it satisfies the triangle inequality. I think Scott actually mentioned that. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's a one-liner. It's, it's fun to see why. OK, again. Okay, here's another property of such a metric. It's right invariant. 
That means if you multiply on the right, by, you take V and you multiply on the right, and you take U and you multiply on the right by a unitary operator W, it takes the same number of gates to get from VW to UW as it took to go from V to U. So the relative complexity is right invariant, between the right multiplication invariant, but it is not left invariant. It is not in general left invariant. If we multiply on the left, then we have to conjugate the product, uh, the product of gates by W, and that itself is not generally a product of N gates. In fact, often it can be very far from the product of N gates. And so the metric defined in this way is, is right invariant and not left invariant. The standard metric, if we, uh, no, the standard metric on SU2 to the N, on the group of unitaries on N qubits, that is bi-invariant. It means it's left and right invariant. And so it's not the right thing. This is just a reflection of the idea that the, uh, that the standard metric is not a good metric for representing complexity or representing uh, chaos. OK, that raises the question, what's the most in general right invariant Riemannian metric? And I'm going to assume the metric <coughs> Complexity metric, I'm going to assume is remarkable. We're going to question that. And I think it was questioned earlier today by Rock, but, uh, but I'm going to assume it. All right, so I'll first begin with a Pauli basis. Of, uh, I'll go to a tangent point. U is a tangent point in the space. And there are a set of basically four to the n dimensions. The space is four to the n dimensional, four to the n minus one if it's SUN. And it's characterized by the Pauli, the Pauli group of Pauli, the set of all possible products of Pauli operators. There are, there are n qubits, there are three n single Pauli operators, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, times n, the number of qubits. Uh, there's, what is it, three n minus three, or two, no, n, well, how many uh, two qubit operators? But I could also take the identity on a given qubit. Yeah, we could, so we could record, so record, record, yeah. record, 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 record. I won't right now. Right. Uh, there are two qubit operators, there are four qubit operators, whatever. Let's call the number of uh, qubits uh, in the operator, let's call the weight. And let's call the generic operator sigma sub i. i runs from 1 to 4 to, uh, one to uh, 4 to the n or something like that. And that's a basis set in the tangent space uh, to the group. What we want to do is define the complexity metric is we want to penalize directions of high weight. We want, we want directions of high weight to correspond to large metric or a large distance. We want to pay a large distance for highly complex operators and a smaller distance for not such complex operators. That would define a metric which would have features similar to, um, to relative complexity. Punish the very complex directions, don't punish the less directions. Oh, incidentally, this is an idea that goes back to Michael Nielsen to describe uh, complexity metrics in terms of Riemannian geometry. All right, I'm, I'm going to go very quickly. I don't like a lot of equations for these things. Um, here's a thing. I think actually Rob wrote it down. Was Rob? You wrote that down today, right? That's the same one that wrote that down. All right, what it is is it's basically the projection of a little differential displacement onto the i-th direction. All right, it's got an extra u on the right-hand side here, but that's what it is. It's the projection of a differential displacement in the group onto the i-th Pauli direction. Here's another symbol, which I originally intended to be an i, but it came out more like a g, which is a good thing, because it's actually the metric, the intended metric in the, um, in the tangent space. All right, so this is in the tangent space, characterized by directions i. Let this be some metric, in a particular metric which will penalize complex directions, and then just construct a metric like this. Don't worry too much about it. It's just a metric which penalizes um, highly complex directions. What kind of thing should we choose for i? Well, after thinking about it for a while, uh, don't think about it, I'll just tell you. First of all, in the corner corresponding to not very complex directions, we don't want to penalize. We just want the metric to be the same as it was in the standard metric. In all the directions which we want to penalize, we want that metric to be big. 
but we want it to grow with the weight of the operator. In other words, here's something which is not too complex, let's give it a two. A little more complex, let's give it a four. Why it's growing exponentially, and whether it should grow exponentially, I won't try to convince you now. I'll just tell you, this is the kind of thing that could represent a good version of a uh, complexity metric, which would be better than describing chaos. Okay, so what do we know about such metrics? The first thing we know is the original bi-invariant metric, which is the good old ordinary metric from SUN, is positively curved. All the sectional curvatures are positive. That means that geodesics originating from a point tend to reconverge. No sign of chaos. The complexity metric one can calculate the sectional curve. Sectional curvatures means uh, curvatures in two-dimensional planes, but generally all the components, uh, co the, the curvatures in general, uh, all of them, are negative, at least if the complexity of uh, <coughs> utilization is big enough. It doesn't have to be very big, just a little bit big. Then the space becomes negatively curved. Sorry, so what is the precise statement? Is it like I calculate the negative curvature and then average it over here in place. Then well, just, just calculate sectional curvature first. And pick a pair of random directions in the space, a pair of generic directions in the space, and calculate the sectional curvature. What you will find is, first of all, generically it's negative, negative, and it has exactly the right order of magnitude for a person, for a purpose, not for a human second. You mean generic easy directions? Yeah, oh, sorry, generic, generic directions that are themselves allowed directions in which the Hamiltonians are uh, considered not very complex. Yes. A pair of easy directions, a pair of easy directions typically will have, almost always, will have a negative curvature. That means the geodesics will, in this metric, will separate and diverge out. So in classical chaos, you can prove that the exponents are independent of the metric which is on yeah, 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 yeah. So what, what's the loophole here? Um, I think I don't think there is a loophole. I think this is a kind of pseudo chaos. It's a kind of pseudo chaos. Um, Yamanov exponents are global things. There's also a notion of a local Yamanov exponent. Okay? Local Yamanov exponents will tell you things diverge, but they may tell you later they'll come back. Okay. If they come back later after an exponentially large time, who cares? And I think that's what goes on. I think if you understand this metric correctly, you'll find that the geodesics diverge for an exponentially long time until the complexities get maximally big, and then they come back and refocus. I think that's what So I think this is a kind of local version of chaos rather than the whole global chaos. But then I would expect that you could tune in the exponents to be whatever you want by changing the metric. I think that's right. I think that's right. I think that's right. But now you say physics. I want physics. Physically, I want to require that operators of large weight and large number of qubits are forbidden, are hard to do. So there's a definitely, without question, there's definitely a bias about what, uh, what basis we're using and so forth. And um, but we've already we've already gone through that. And, all right, so the metric in these units is negatively curved, suggesting that the motion of unitary operators in this group generated by Hamiltonians, which are simple Hamiltonians, <coughs> local Hamiltonians, will diverge. There's two, there's two versions. Two slightly different Hamiltonians, or the same Hamiltonian with a slight gap in the starting point, they'll both diverge and, um, and create something that looks like chaos. I, I happen to think that that's what quantum chaos is. That quantum chaos takes place when this kind of thing happens. Uh, OK, one more thing. Let, I'm, I'm going to think, basically, I think Scott said it, um, that we can think of the evolution of the state vector or the evolution of the unitary operator as a kind of motion on this space. I'm going to think of it as a motion of a non-relativistic particle on this very, very high dimensional space. 
How does it move? Well, it moves on geodesics, at least if the Hamiltonian is itself not complex. If the Hamiltonian is itself is k local, then, uh, then these things, then motion will be on geodesics, and that will be the equation of motion for this fake non-relativistic particle. But then you may ask, what happened to the Hamiltonian that I started with? Here, the rules are just the rules of motion on this negatively curved space. What happened to the Hamiltonian? So I'll tell you what happened to the Hamiltonian. Let's take a Hamiltonian of the SYK type. Well, it's not quite the SYK type. This is not fermions, but it could be fermions. We do this with the SYK model. A set of coupling constants, a set of simple operators, low, uh, low complexity operators. The Hamiltonian, of course, tells you how things move with time. Basically, they tell you the velocity of the motion away from the starting point. So in fact, if you trace it out, you will discover that what the Hamiltonian is, is it's just the initial velocity moving away from the origin, that means the unit operator, starting with the unit operator, the, uh, the coefficients in the Hamiltonian, the j's, are nothing but the components of velocity along the basis directions of i. In other words, the Hamiltonian is replaced in this model, or in, this, um, in this model of motion on a hyperbolic Space, uh, the Hamiltonian is replaced by the initial conditions on velocity. The initial velocity. Okay, now let's consider exactly the SYK strategy of averaging over J coefficients. That's the ensemble that we're going to think about. In particular, let's follow SYK and the other people who study this and make a Gaussian ensemble. A Gaussian ensemble for the J's. Since the J's are nothing but velocities, the Gaussian ensemble for J is equivalent to a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities. It's not a little like kinetic theory. The, uh, the uh, probabilistic character of the Hamiltonian translates into motion on this space by saying the initial state is Maxwell Boltzmann uh, distributed in the loss uh, I think I won't get into um, questions of Komogara complexity here. I think I'll leave that out of this discussion. It does come in, and if you ask me why, I will tell you, but, uh, but not right now. Okay, so let's now trace an ensemble. Let's start with an ensemble of starting points near the origin. The origin means the, uh, the unit the operator. And let's take a whole population, a statistical population of starting points near the origin, with a statistical distribution, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities. How does it evolve? Well, exactly as <coughs> I imagine. No, that's not how it evolves. It's not way. It just grows. Every point moves away with a velocity that is characterized by the appropriate J and it creates an increasing volume in the, uh, in the configuration space, volume which increases in the configuration space, and it looks a lot like an increase of entropy. So it looks a lot, but of course, of course it's not true entropy. So your distribution analyzes velocities in the bad direction? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have to think of this. Yeah. There's a lot of conserved no quantities here. Uh, a lot of quantities. A lot of conserved quantities, and they're associated with, uh, with the right invariance. It's a big right invariance, a lot of conserved quantities, and uh, so things take place in, uh, in something. Yeah. Uh, you, suppose, suppose my unitary is just a potential property of the Hadamard. So is what? I'm confused. So suppose my unitary is a potential product of Hadamard. It's a potential um, property. It's, it's a potential product. On each qubit, it acts as a Hadamard gate, which is x plus z. Um, yeah, no. So then you have, if you span it, if you span it in terms of properties, you have exponentially many directions of velocity. But it's very simple, complexity-wise. Yeah. So yeah. how does this picture look like? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. There are, there are, I think what you're saying is there are special directions which are simple. Your unitary is like special of a simple yeah. yeah. There are, there's, there's a set of measure zero, a small number. If I take a generic Hamiltonian, Generic Hamiltonian, which means a generic collection of J's, it will 
y in these negative recurve directions. And if you say, supposing I just took the Hamiltonian to be one sigma, one simple sigma by itself, that just generates a motion that goes around in a little circle. I can take two of them and they go around in a little circle. What I'm saying is that you could take a Hamiltonian, with, which looks like it's very complicated, but in fact it's very simple. It would be some combination of exponential yeah, yeah, directions, yeah, yeah. but still it's very yeah. simple. Okay, I would say if you generically pick from this ensemble, this Gaussian ensemble, it's not what will happen. That's probably true. Right. This, this example you have is a simple unit term. It's not, yeah. a, it's not yeah. a complicated one. I know. So you tell them how you want to understand. No, I mean, that's yeah, high that's weight, though, doesn't it? it, it yeah. The weight well, is high. You said a, you said a Hadamard on every cubit. Right? Yeah. Well, okay. That's right. Very high. No, no, no. The no, no, no. weight is low, because the, the Hamiltonian that will generate that is the sum of the single yeah, parameters. Yeah, that's right. That's correct. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wait, yeah. We should really not be multiplying by sigma. We should be multiplying by e to the i epsilon sigma. That was a good point. OK. Yeah, so. First of all, the complexity is expected to grow linearly with time, at least for some period. So that means that we'll move out in this space in a way that the complexity itself grows linearly with time. Second of all, and now here is where a real conjecture comes in, the volume of the cloud, because of the negative curvature, because of the negative curvature, I expect the volume of the crowd to grow exponentially with time, and therefore exponentially with the complexity itself. In fact, I think even stronger than that, that if I were to take a cloud, the cloud corresponding to some complexity, or some complexity less than a certain amount, that the volume in the phase space of that cloud will be exponential in the complexity. The logarithm of that volume will be the complexity, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm identifying entropy with complexity. Or entropy with this, or oh, sorry, that's why I'm identifying uh, the average ensemble complexity with the fake entropy of this uh, fake system, which as Scott said, is just the evolution of the wave function itself. Why is there a hole? Oh, I suppose. <laughs> Well, the, 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 the velocities are probably, it's maxwell Boltzmann distributed, but... Uh, I mean, last time I checked, gas does not expand in giant. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> probably right. Probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny. You know how to make a hole in the right I'm sure your father can plug that hole. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the conjecture is that the auxiliary entropy of, of the auxiliary system is the ensemble average of the complexity. Now this is either true or it's not true. If it's not true, that would be very sad. There would be no uh, good uh, story here. So I would assume that it's true. First of all, one of the things that this would explain is the character of this curve. Remember what this curve is? It's, a, it's the evolution of complexity as a function of time. It grows more or less linearly. Well, entropy also grows linearly for a period of time. The coefficient uh, that it grows with is called the uh, Kolmogorov's and I entropy. It grows linearly. It eventually gets to some maximum value. It rattles around and does things. And then it takes the complexity in this case, takes an exponential amount of time to reach maximum. But that's because the auxiliary system has exponentially many degrees of freedom. Next, over a doubly exponential time, there will be quantum recurrences. The quantum recurrences, the complexity will go down, white hole, white hole, white hole. And then it will go back up, black hole, black hole, black hole. And this will repeatedly happen over and over and over again. And that evolution can be understood. Nobody's proved this, incidentally, about complexity. Scott and I talk about it. He uh, uh, draws boxes, but uh, <laughs> yeah. under, under a reasonable complexity hypothesis, something like this. Something like this property. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, so we can understand it by saying that complexity is the entropy of a system of exponentially many. Sorry, sorry, you already have a definition of the complexity in terms of the distance in the Nielsen metric. Yeah. And then it seems this is not a. a, a Remember, the, ense the ensemble average of the complexity is the entropy. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm saying the earlier part where complexity is defined as the distance yeah. in the Nielsen metric. Yeah. And it seems like a, this is not a, a separate conjecture, but it's a consequence of that. A negative curvature. It's got to do with negative so, curvature. So the real conjecture is. Some, it's negative curve. But I thought that you said that already. Well, yeah, look, I, I, um, I, could have, I could have said it's a fact, it's totally. Okay? But I know deep in my heart that, uh, that I can't prove this. There's big pieces missing that I don't really know how to fill. So let's, uh, let, me, let me finish with, let me tell the story. Can I ask, sir, one other thing? So, at least with the ordinary second law, there's some coarse graining involved. Really yeah, I think there's coarse graining so involved. Here, there is some, some also. Yes, that's right. And the coarse gradings, I think, match. There are logarithmic divergences in complexity when you make your epsilon ball smaller and smaller, and there are logarithmic divergences in classical entropy. Yeah. And I think they match. I see. Okay. Yeah. So that's implicitly going on. That's right. Here. That's right. Now, Kolmogorov's side of the story is also interesting. I'll tell you quickly what. No, I'm not worried about If you ask me, I'm afraid about that. All right, now we come to complexity for steam engineers. How many steam engineers do we have here? Well, they're, they're all down on the second floor of the steam engineers. <laughs> and uh, steam engineers now mean uh, people who uh, would like to use a quantum computer. Uh, <laughs> steam okay. I claim that there's a quantity called uncomplexity. Uncomplexity, I'll tell you what it is in a minute, that it's a resource. Now, I honestly don't know enough about resource theory to be sure that this fits into the, uh, into the standard story about resource theory. There's a resource theory. You probably know about it. I don't know. You know about it? I'm looking at it more yet. More check All right, so there's this thing called resource theory. I don't know if this fits into it exactly or not. I suspect it does. But I'm going to use it in a slightly um, uh, loose sense. The uncomplexity is the maximal complexity of a system minus the actual complexity. It is very much like the quantity which I began to call entropy. <laughs> but uh, I decided not to call it entropy when I, when I looked up and found out that it actually has a name that's called negative entropy, which is S max minus S. Yes. S max minus S max minus S is a resource. It's a resource that your entropy is less than maximum. You can do things with it. You can raise weights. You know, you can lift weights up with it and do stuff like that. If your entropy is less than maximum, and I claim that you can do computational work if the complexity is less than maximum. And by computational work, I mean a particular thing. It's what Adam and I call directed computation. In particular, it means you know, work. What about work? When I speak about work, I mean raising a weight, and I mean doing it without Maxwell Beamings. Okay? I mean doing it without running against the grain of the second law. Okay? What I mean by computational work is interesting computation that you can do without having Maxwell Beamings. Is that a good enough definition? Uh, more or less. Can you give an example? Yeah, I'm going to give you an example. I'll work out an example in some detail. All right, for most purposes, uh, let's, let's start with a computer. Let's pick a quantum computer, which has been run into the ground. It has run for a very long time. Uh, it's in a pure state, incidentally. When I use the word state, I always mean pure state. I think it is a disaster that people have started to use the term state in mixed state. I think the community should be punished for that. <laughs> the Germans, of course, called it a gemisch. And uh, that, that's acceptable to me. But to call a density matrix a state is just a crime, not capital crime. <laughs> What's, the hmm? What's so criminal about it? That's just dreadful. <laughs> 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 to me, a state 
state is a state, you know, aside. Yeah. What, what, what they're at called a state. Is the quantum computer allowed to do measurements? No. No. We will, we will consider the measurement process separate. We'll consider the measurement process as a separate event that you do at the end of lifting the weight, okay? But what do we do a measurement at the beginning prepares uh, an uncomplex state? I think what I, I'm not sure I heard one exactly, but uh, let me let me state the uh, eighth question. If you're carrying <laughs> if you're having a state which is burning to the ground, which means it's become maximally complex, you can make a measurement, and uh, this is what you're saying, and yeah. you can return it to a simple state. Yeah. Right. Right. So let's start with any state you like, simple or not, not. Run the computer for a very very long time, exponentially long time. It runs to maximal complexity. I say that that computer is useless. For most purposes, a maximally complex state is similar to a maximal <coughs> density matrix. It's hard to tell the difference. Uh, a maximally complex state and a, max, a maximally mixed density matrix, a, st a starting point for computation is no good for anything. If you conjugate it from the left and the right with any unitary operator, you just get back the original uh, maximally, uh, yeah. But is it just saying that there isn't a natural error of time that state, therefore you can't? Well, it's one thing. It's true. There's not a natural error of time. Um, but it, it's just it's just whatever you hit that state with, it'll just rattle around among these very maximally com uh, complex states in the beginning. But you'll, you'll see a little more clearly. It's not just that, the, that there's uh, you know. um, Right. In other words, you need some uncomplexity if you want to do computational work. <coughs> All right, now consider what happens. This is a very interesting example. I didn't invent it. It was invented by Knill, Knill, Knill and Lang. Yeah. Right? Well, I'll tell you what happens. It's very unintuitive, at least it was to me. I learned about it from Patrick. I forgot about it. And Scott reminded me about it. Uh, consider what happens. If you take a maximally complex state and just add one qubit, one clean qubit, a clean qubit means one which is not entangled with the rest of the mess of a, of a complex state. Just add a single clean, unentangled qubit to an exhausted computer of n qubits. Adding, by adding, I, I mean you just hold it in your hand uh, a little bit away from the rest of the stuff. This does not change the complexity. You just added one qubit in a pure state doesn't change the complexity, but it does double the maximal complexity. If you allow that computer to, uh, sorry, if you allow the qubit to fall into the computer and uh, get mixed up, the uh, maximal complexity is doubled. Okay? So adding the clean qubit takes the complexity, the uncomplexity, from zero in the maximally exhausted state to two to the n. That means we should be able, if the hypothesis is right, if thermal dynamics is making sense here, we should be able to do some kind of computational work with this one clean qubit computer. In fact, we might even be able to do very complicated things because we have this huge amount of uncomplexity around here. Here's the way I want to think about it. Exactly. If you want to go home, um, it's OK. <laughs> this picture represents, again, the space of either unitary operators or the space of states. At the center is the simplest thing. It could be the unit operator or the un unentangled state. And the stars represent target points. You want to calculate something. You want to calculate, you want the computer to calculate, and I want it to calculate the quantity x. The stars are places where if you get to these places and make a measurement, you learn something about x. For example, the stars could represent the place where the expectation value of the first qubit is equal to x. So if you run the computer and you make a measurement, you learn something about x. You run it two or three times and you learn more and more about x. So stars are target points. Here they are. And if you start in the simplest state and run toward a star, you can do that without violating the second law of com complexity. You don't have to run backward. You start simple, you can get anywhere from someplace simple. And so without a Maxwell demon to, uh, to run you backward in complexity, 
you can get to the stars if you start here. If you start out in the boundary, which represents all the maximally complicated states, all the maximally complex states, and you start out here, you're not going to get anywhere. All you will do is rattle around among this tremendously doubly exponential set of, uh, of um, maximally complicated states. And there are no stars out there. Why are there no stars out there? Because in a maximally complicated state, everything has a random expectation value. Right, so there are no stars out there. Starting out here, and the second law will not allow you to get to a star from here without a maximum. Okay, now let's throw in our unentangled clean qubit. What does that do? That doubles the amount of uncomplexity. It doubles the dimension of the Hilbert space. It gives you a lot more volume out here. And there are stars out here. Where are we starting? We're starting in what was previously the maximally entangled, that, sorry, the maximally uh, complex region out here. But now we have new places we can get to. We've actually doubled the amount of uh, the volume, doubled the, uh, the radius of this, doubled the uh, maximum complexity. And there are, there are stars out there in general. Because this is not maximal complexity, maximal complexity is way out here at the edge here. And so we might expect that we can do some computational work, starting with what was previously maximal complexity and adding a single qubit. Let me show you. Example. This is the example of student Hill and Laflamme. It solves a very hard problem with one clean qubit. It's the problem of calculating the trace of a product of a sort of random, highly complex product of gates. In fact, just take any unitary operator, but I'm interested in the product of gates. Call it G, it's unitary, and uh, let's say uh, that it's pretty darn complex and we would like to calculate the trace of it. There are a number of interesting problems which, uh, which correspond to calculating the trace of uh, unitary matrices. I am told that one of them is approximating Jones polynomials, but I don't know where Jones polynomial is. Uh, that do not, that, uh, but it's, it's considered a hard problem. And this is, in general, a very hard problem if G is itself complex. It can be done by one clean qubit computation. Here's a circuit for it. I'm not going to explain the circuit afterwards, not, not tonight, but tomorrow anybody who wants to know exactly how the circuit works and how it implements the calculation is G. That's the thing whose trace we want to calculate. These are Hadamards. We start with a clean qubit in the zero state. Here's the maximally entangled, oh, sorry, the maximally complex state. And we do a controlled G operation in the Hadamard basis. In fact, you might say, wait a minute, this implementing this G here, that's a monstrous thing to do because it involves, it could involve all of the qubits simultaneously. But in fact, we can, we can do the computation by breaking apart G into, uh, into its individual gates and doing it repetitively. Doing it repetitively is like raising a weight on the raising it again, raising it again, raising it again incrementally. OK, what's the initial complexity? 2 to the n. What's the maximal complexity? 2 to the n plus 1. What's the uncomplexity to begin with? 2 to the n. After you do this, you can calculate what happens, and you can calculate the final uncomplexity. What it is is the initial uncomplexity less the complexity of G. So what this is saying is that the more complex G is, the more you use up your resource. You're using your resource to do computational work. And you can think of each one of these as a little pull on the rope, which pulls up uh, a weight, if you like. I mean, it's not bad, but it's analogous to that. And each time you put in one of these gates, you diminish the complexity by an amount equal to the complexity of that gate. And by the time you're finished, the, you have used up that much complexity. That means you can calculate the complexity of a G, which is itself very complex from this uh, point of view. 
And uh, that's an example of doing directed computation work, uh, having a resource that in this case is this uncomplexity problem. So it's, it is. So, so it, it, this problem, you emphasize this uncomplexity. In this problem, you emphasize this uncomplexity, but I think for this algorithm, you use, also use that the, this mass state is very complicated, right? Yes. So there, couldn't you think of that as a resource also? Because if you didn't have the complicated state, well, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> Right. I, I think that's like saying you can't run a steam engine without having some steam. But in, but in the case with it, right. So so it, it's not just that there's only one resource that you need. There may be many resources that you need to actually capture something. But, but look, if we started with a simple state, we could easily yeah. prepare. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. So, uh, but you know, nevertheless, one's right. Dude. As long as run a steam engine, we need some steam. Yeah. So, all right, uh, let's see, do I have two more minutes, three more minutes? I'll tell you another little story. This story is kind of interesting. Now oh, there's another one, one of my wife's name. Oh, Lord. Jonathan, <laughs> hit F5. Oh, no. Go to the bottom and hit F5. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's another one of my students. <laughs> Don't go too far. No, 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 no. Yeah, that, is okay. 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 <laughs> that is called Lonesome Tree. If you want to buy it, it's five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> From current slide. Yeah. Oh, the top left from current slide. Okay. Yeah, from current slide. From current slide. Okay, good. There you go. Let's go. Yes, let's shift up. Hey. Going over here. Going, going, going. This is the cast. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. There is no one. Stop, stop, stop. Or, here's Alice. Up here, this is Alice, a black hole. Up here is a time of order exponential of the entropy. That's when the black hole runs itself into the ground. Its complexity becomes maximal at a time, exponential in the number of uh, qubits, if you like. And so up here, I'm cutting this off just to remind you that at this point, this computer, which is composed of a black hole, has reached maximum entropy. Just to remind you that's what it is. Here's Alice, and Alice is planning on jumping into the black hole. She's not sure exactly when she's going to jump in. She's going to jump in over here, maybe she'll jump in over here, maybe she'll jump in over here. She might even jump in up here. Okay, that might be dangerous. Uh, I think it is dangerous, but we can argue about that. But uh, let's say she's going to jump in before the computer runs out of uh, steam altogether. And she's interested in a resource. What resource is she interested in? She's interested in the existence of space and time behind the horizon. Now, her purpose is that's all she cares about. She wants to know, is there space behind the horizon or not? Okay. So let's ask, let's go and ask the question, how much uncomplexity is there? Not clear that uncomplexity has anything to do with this problem. OK, Alice first asks, what's the complexity of the black hole? And she says it's the, or the, the, um, the action or the volume of the wheel of the width patch anchored at her time. What's the maximum complexity? The maximum complexity is the complexity at time at the ex end of the exponential time. So it's the action of this whole region here. That's the maximum complexity. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the maximal complexity and the actual complexity? Go back and here. Here's the original complexity, here's the maximal complexity, here's the original complexity, the maximal complexity. The difference is this. 
What is this? This is the union of all possible places that Alice can find or get to or reach, the union of every place she can visit, jumping into the black hole after time t. Mm -hmm. Is it, am I justified in calling that a resource? I don't know. I thought it was an interesting connection. And another interesting connection between complexity, in this case, uncomplexity, and in this case, actual observable volume. But you're assuming now that there's nothing in the tiny little triangle behind the blue. Yeah, I am kind of assuming that the, that so, the black hole becomes maximally complex, so I think bad things happen. I am assuming that. All right, that, uh, that's, that's the last slide, except the one last painting that my wife made, which I like very much, and therefore I will show it. That's only 2000. <laughs> Thank you very much. If I if I if for a mixed thing I'm not allowed to use a state, is a Canadian allowed to use the word province? If I'm not allowed to use the big state as a state, as a Canadian, if I'm allowed to you call it a province? So is there a... Is there you're a, not a Canadian, you're an American. I'm both. I'm both. Is, is there a complexity temperature, and if so, is there a complexity thermometer I can measure it with? That's a very interesting question. I, I wanted to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really did. I wanted to sit down with you and, 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 and uh, you and me and Adam and see if we can understand that. that, that, that I'm very curious right. about that. Yeah. But I don't have a, I don't have a good answer. So I cannot measure complexity directly. Uh, but, but here you can measure the uncomplex. Well, you can. Uh, it, yes, yeah, so I mean, if you could, then you could have measured ask the question, can you have a computer that will be able to perform some computation versus one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's no, you can measure directly if you know what the wave function is. There's just no linear operator that corresponds yeah, yeah, yeah. to complexity. Well, there's so no measurement. It's similarly here, there's no measurement that tells you how much space time is available. There's no linear operator that tells you how much space time is available. I'll tell you what, right. the thermometer but they have an ensemble of an exponentially large number of identical computers, and then you can measure the complexity. But entropy is not observable either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. nor is temperature, but still yeah. they're bombing. But somehow, somehow we get through. Yeah, I don't know. So, uh, if I compare a general uh, geometry, for some reason, the, the world of impact is not in the size of the similarity. And for some, uh, some reason, it's not in the size of similarity. Uh, is, this is this difference uh, in something simple in the complexity? We don't know. You're asking now the, the, the strange fact, for example, it's kind of a, it's a doesn't increase. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. if I compare, if I look at a state that yeah. the complexity keep in mind, keep in mind the time scale for the transient that it corresponds to is basically one unit of time in the, uh, in the computer's clock, in the one ADS time. So it's a very small transient time where, where the complexity uh, Okay. Uh, yes, so Patrick. Uh, so uncomplexity seems to be a resource in the sense that um, it potentially allows you to do interesting computational work, right? but it's not sufficient. Like if that, I think it's not sufficient. Uh, right. So there, the analogy to thermodynamics seems to break down a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure. I uh, okay. It's the free energy or something. It's like the free available free energy. You don't you, you don't actually have to use the free energy to work, which you could. So I think it's like the available. Free. No, but the point is that even if it's even if you have uncomplexity, you might not be able to do any interesting computation. Uh, maybe yeah, I may be just no hot reservoir. Hot reservoir and cold reservoir. Two reservoirs. Yeah. yeah. So you it may be like cold reservoir and hot reservoir. Yeah. In your scheme is the hot reservoir. Yeah. So, so, so you may need both to run something. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, but and complexity you, alone should, uh, I think, give you something yeah. already. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's where analogy may not be perfect. Yeah. So, so well, this, you know, these are all questions that are exactly the questions that uh, Dan and I have asked each other. Suppose I take my n qubit complex a and I measure one of them in the zero one basis, so it becomes a clean. And then I, right, right. when I do a computation, again. No, the, the rules of this game, I think, and I think everybody who does this kind of um, one clean qubit and so forth, they will, they will say the rules of the game are that the computation consists of everything up to the measurement. The measurement, you factor up and you think of that as a separate thing. So the question is the work that you do is the work needed to get to the stars. When you got to the star, then you make your measurement. So I think the natural thermodynamics analogy is, uh, is the work needed to get to the star. You can't do the measurement if you don't have a clean qubit to start with. Right? You think about implementing the measurement. Uh -huh. yeah. So that if you allow yourself to perform measurements, you're kind of sneaking in the clean qubits. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's so far past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was going to ask, at this workshop we have heard many different forms of complexity. Is yeah. there a reason to believe that this one somehow is the best one? No, the best one. Um, there are several different forms of complexity. What's that? Sphere. Ah. A resource. Program. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the complexity that we're talking about here is a big complexity. Yeah. And that corresponds to the position of entropy of the gas cloud. There's also the complexity of what Hamiltonian is. The Hamiltonian itself might be described by a bunch of J's. Imagine that like, the J's are just 0 or 1, which is simplicity. So the Hamiltonian would be described by a bit string. Okay. That bit string is Colorado. And it's the thing which distinguishes, which tells you how complex uh, the, the, um, the entropy associated with that, the entropy associated with that is the thermal entropy associated with the maxwell boltzmann velocity distribution. And I think, yes, we decided it was, oh yes, it's a resource for erasure. If you want to erase, you've got to put your uh, erased qubit someplace. Was that, do I have that right? Yeah, it was, a, it was a resource for being able to erase, which means a resource for a way to put your uh, erased uh, So I think, yeah. So it doesn't mean really to go up here. Yeah. Not, not that the Commodore complex is a resource, it's uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Good, okay. We meet tomorrow again. And, uh, I hope everybody's having fun because it's just a fantastic conference. You, you, you've inspired me to shoot for the stars. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>